Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Welcome to the Puritan and Reformed audiobook podcast. This ministry was started in 1985 and now, 29 years later, has become the largest collection of Puritan and Reformed sermons and books in audiobook format. The narrator is Tom Sullivan. We would like to hear from you. Your comments, questions, and criticisms are welcome. This is the Puritan and Reformed Audiobook Podcast. The following sermon is mentioned in Jonathan Edwards' treatise on the religious affections and quoted there. That is how I first became aware of it. The sermon is called The Way to Know Sincerity in Hypocrisy Cleared Up. Solomon Stoddard Everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8 Godliness is a thing of great concern. The acceptance of services, the hearing of prayers, and the salvation of the soul depend upon it. And because it is of such moment, the comfort of men much depends upon the knowledge of it. But there is a great deal of darkness in the minds of men about it. Many times godly men have scruples and sometimes great fears that they are not godly. They often sit in judgment on themselves and are at a loss what sentence to pronounce. And some ungodly men have great hopes that they are in a good estate and still comforts that do not belong to them. Some cannot see their way to condemn themselves, and some give judgment for themselves. But the apostle here directs the one sort and the other in the determination of their condition. First, he tells us how a godly man may know his godliness. He who sees the workings of the grace of love in himself, he who sees more or fewer actings of that grace, may conclude for himself that he is born of God has had a work of regeneration, that the gospel has had a saving efficacy on his heart, that he has a spiritual knowledge of God, and that his eyes have been opened to see the glory of God. Second, he tells us how hypocrites may know their hypocrisy. He who does not love, who lives in the omission of love, who has nothing of the working of that spirit, who lives in the neglect of it, has not the spiritual knowledge of God whatever pretenses he makes. This casts the case against him. The like we may say with respect to every other grace, he who believes on Jesus Christ, who loves God, who has godly sorrow, is born of God. But he who does not believe in Christ, who loves not God, who is not godly sorrow, knows not God, whatever professions he makes. Men may know their hypocrisy only by their course of life, but their sincerity only by particular acts. There are two sorts of professors, saints and hypocrites. Some are compared to weed and some to chaff. Matthew 3, verse 12. He will gather the weed into his garner, but he will burn up chaff with unquenchable fire. Some are compared to stony and thorny ground, some to good ground. Matthew 13, verse 20. Some have a wedding garment, some have not. Matthew 22, verse 11. Some are compared to wise, some to foolish virgins. Matthew 25, verses 1 to 2. Some are compared to men who build upon a rock, others to men who build upon the sand. Matthew 7, verse 24. And many persons are studying this question of what sort they are. This doctrine resolves it. Proposition 1. Hypocrisy is to be known only by their course of life. 
men know it only by their walk. For the clearing of this, consider particular acts of sin are no evidence of hypocrisy. Many internal acts of sin are no evidence of hypocrisy. Every godly man has a corrupt principle remaining in him, and that principle does not lie still, but is busy and active. Though it is mortified, yet it is full of life. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. It is like a fountain always springing up. Galatians 5, verse 17. The flesh lusts against the spirit. Romans 7, verse 21. I find a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. The choicest saints every day find the stirrings of corruption. If they are alone, if they are in company, if they are in the works of their calling, if they are exercising themselves in the duties of religion, they are always haunted with a corrupt heart. They have a multitude of evil thoughts, desires, delights, fears, sorrows. Unbelief is often stirring, so pride and worldliness, frowardness and envy. There are many stirrings of sin that they do not perceive, but an abundance falls under their observation. A corrupt principle will stir upon all occasions. Everything that occurs will awaken it. Therefore, saints are warned to keep their hearts with all diligence. Proverbs 4, verse 23. And godly men have great occasion every day to repent, and to say, as Paul in Romans 7, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Secondly, many external acts of sin are no evidence of hypocrisy. Men have much more command of their words and outward actions than of their thoughts and the inward workings of their hearts. Yet godly men are often guilty of external sins. They commit many sins in words. James 3 verse 8 The tongue is an unruly evil. Many times our words savor of vanity, pride, unbelief, and uncontentedness. And they are often guilty of other external sins. Psalm 19 verse 12 who can understand his errors? Every corruption is running them into transgression, sometimes omitting duty, sometimes committing sin. They are guilty of many sins of ignorance. Men who understand general rules often fail in applying them to particular cases. There are many proud, worldly, froward carriages that they are not aware of and are ready to justify. And many sins are committed through inadvertency. They are hurried through fear or passion or pride, and consider not at the time, but presently after they see it, and are sorry for it. Number three. An act of gross transgression is no evidence. Gross transgressions are not the ordinary spots of God's children, but grace is no certain preservation from them. Mortified corruption may run a man into such transgression as many natural men were never guilty of. Gross transgressions are of such a nature that they seem to be inconsistent with grace. But as a man who has corruption in him may do choice acts of holiness... So a man who has grace in him may commit gross acts of sin. If a man's nature is much weakened, yet in a fit he may act very strongly. So if men's corruptions are much weakened, yet they may have fits wherein they may act very powerfully. It is an idle thing to think that such things are impossible, as several times have come to pass. Noah's intemperance, Lot's incest, David's adultery, and Peter's denying of Christ are unanswerable arguments that gross transgression is no evidence of a hypocrite. It is no wonder if a gross transgression should make a man suspect his godliness, but it is no evidence. If God withdraws from a godly man, his grace will not prevent gross transgression. Natural conscience often preserves men, but grace does not always preserve men 
from gross sin. Roman numeral 2. A course of sin is an evidence of hypocrisy. If a man makes a profession of religion and lives in a way of sin against the light of his conscience, he is a hypocrite. He who makes a profession and contradicts it in his conversation is a hypocrite. Titus 1 verse 16 They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. He who pretends to godliness and turns aside to crooked ways is a hypocrite. For those who are really godly live in a way of obedience. Psalm 119 verses 1 to 3 Blessed are the undefiled in the way that walk in the way of the Lord. They also do no iniquity. Luke 1 verse 6 They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But such as live in ways of sin are dissemblers. For all such will be rejected in the day of judgment. Matthew 7 verse 23 Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The like we have in Luke 13, verse 27. If men live in a way of disobedience, they have not a spirit of faith. For faith sanctifies men. Acts 26, verse 18. Sanctified by faith that is in me. If men live in a way of disobedience, they are not Christ's sheep. For sheep hear his voice. John 10, 27. Men that live in a way of disobedience are not born of God. 1 John 3, verse 9. He that is born of God sinneth not. Men who live in a way of disobedience are the servants of sin. John 8, verse 34. He that committeth sin is the servant of sin. A course of external sin is an evidence of hypocrisy, whether it is a sin of omission or commission. If men live in the neglect of known duties, or in the practice of known evils, that will be their condemnation. Let the sin be what it will. Let it be profaneness, drunkenness, uncleanness, lying, or injustice. Thus it was with the sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. They are called sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord, 1 Samuel 2, verse 12. The foundation of their censor was their profaneness and uncleanness. So it was with Jehu, notwithstanding his ill and destroying Baal, because he practiced and tolerated the worship of the calves at Dan and Bethel. 2 Kings 10, verse 31. Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart and with all his soul, for he turned aside after the sin of Jeroboam. So many of the Pharisees were wicked because they devoured widows' houses, Matthew twenty three fourteen. Thus Judas appeared to be a hypocrite because he lived in theft, John 12, verse 6. He was a thief that showed the rottenness of the heart of Demas, that he was an apostate, 2 Timothy 4, verse 10. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present evil world. To live impenitently in any outward known sin will cast against a man and prove him an hypocrite. Number two. A course of internal sin proves a man to be an hypocrite. Though he washes his hands, if he does not cleanse his heart, he is ungodly. The external conversation of some hypocrites may exceed the conversation of some saints, but if there is a way of internal sin, their pretenses to godliness are vain. There are two sorts of internal sins which men may live in a way of, and is a witness against them. One is a way of corrupt thoughts and affections. If men allow themselves in malice, envy, wanton or profane thoughts, that will condemn them. Though those corruptions do not break out in any scandalous way, though thoughts are an evidence of a rotten heart, Titus 3, verse 3, we ourselves are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and enmity, hateful and hating one another, 
If a man allows himself, though he thinks he does not, in malice or envy, he is a hypocrite. Though his conscience disallows it, yet if his heart allows it, he is no saint. If he does not hate and mortify those corrupt affections, he is no saint. The other way of living in internal sin is to live in the omission of spiritual duties. Whether a man knows it or knows it not, it is an evidence of hypocrisy. Many men who make a fair show do not believe in Jesus Christ. They have a persuasion of the truth of the gospel. They hope Christ will save them. They have had some joy in hearing the gospel, but they do not believe in Christ. Either they are carnally confident or discouraged. This condemns them. He that believeth not, the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3, verse 36. He who is contentious and obeys not the gospel will be condemned. Romans 2, verse 8. So if a man lives in the neglect of love to God, if there is no hearty love to God in his profession, in his obedience, he is not godly. Though there is affection, yet if there is not hearty love, that will condemn him. That was the condemnation of the Jews in John 5, verse 42. I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. If men are zealous, if men have tenderness of conscience, if men delight in Sabbaths, but are destitute of love to God, they are hypocrites. So also if there is not a spirit of love to saints, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, and become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal, so 1 John 4, verse 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God. Proposition 2. Sincerity is known by particular acts of grace. The habits of grace cannot be seen immediately. As no man can see his own soul, or any of the faculties of it immediately, so we cannot see the gracious principles that are there immediately. And there is no external act of obedience that is evidential, for an ungodly man may do an external act of obedience. He may give all his goods to the poor and his body to be burned, though he has no charity. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3. But by particular acts of grace, they may know their uprightness, and by them only. If a man were to try his sincerity by a certain knowledge of his gracious carriages day by day, he would never attain assurance, but be under perpetual uncertainty. But by particular acts of grace, he may know it. Consider number one. Saints may certainly see particular acts of grace. Though there are many acts of grace that a man does not know to be such, yet some acts of grace are plain to see. We find Christ inquiring of one, whether he believed, John 9, verse 35, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And of another, whether he loved him, John 21, verse 16. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? That shows that such things may be known, else to what purpose would it be to ask those questions? And reason shows that they may be seen. For they greatly differ from all counterfeit acts, and sometimes grace acts very strongly and apparently. And we have an account in Scripture of saints who have spoken very confidently about the workings of a spirit of grace. Job 42, verses 5 and 6. Now mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I abhor myself in dust and ashes. He saw the mighty workings of a spirit of repentance, and was at no loss about it. So David in Psalm 116, verse 1, I love the Lord. He speaks of it as of a thing he was assured of. The like workings of heart he found towards the law in Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. So Peter appeals to Christ, who knew his heart. In John 21, verse 17, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee and others have had a like experience. Number two. Ordinarily, they certainly see but few particular acts of grace. 
there is a very great difference in godly men upon this account. I take it for granted that there are not two men in ten thousand who have just the same experience. More generally, godly men hope and think that they exercise grace many times every day in their prayers, in their callings, and in their conversation with men, but it is but now and then that they can certainly speak up to it. There are great mixtures of corruption with grace. There are many false appearances of grace which make them afraid whether they indeed have exercised grace. And this makes it evident that it is thus with saints. That many of them are for a long time under doubts whether they are indeed godly. So we have these precepts, Second Peter 1 verse 10. Give all diligence to make your calling and election sure. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Some hypocrites are a great deal more confident than many saints. Many godly men are at a loss whether their faith is anything other than what unconverted men may have. And so they are about their other graces. There are some saints who have assurance, but the foundation of it is is that now and then they see the plain actings of faith, love, and repentance. They see something of encouragement from their daily walk. But that which begets assurance is that sometimes they plainly see grace. Number three. By these visible actings of grace, they may conclude there is a course of gracious carriages. Godly men are described to be men who walk in a course of holiness. Psalm 119 verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way that walk in the law of the Lord. And we find that godly men have been well satisfied that they have walked in a way of holiness. 2 Kings 20, verse 3. Remember, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. If it is inquired how they know that their obedience is not the fruit of natural conscience and common grace, as it is with many others, the answer is that they see now and then the plain exercises of grace, and from this conclude that they are under the influence of a gracious spirit in their walk. That though they are guilty of much formality and hypocrisy, Yet there is a spirit of holiness working in them and a hearty care to keep the commandments of God. If a man sees now and then a spirit of love to God, he may safely conclude that his religion is not the fruit of ostentation or slavish fear, but that a gracious spirit stirs him up to perform his duty and that his walk is holy. Application number 1. Of awakening to those who live in a course of sin. Some make pretenses to godliness, whereby they not only deceive others, but, which is a great deal worse, they deceive themselves also. But this will condemn them that they live in a course of sin. And such must go with ungodly men. Psalm 125, verse 5. As for such as turn aside under their crooked ways, the Lord will lead them forth with the workers of iniquity. If there is a great change in a man's carriage, and he is reformed in several particulars, Yet if there is one evil way, the man is an ungodly man. If he does choice service for the church of God, yet he is an ungodly man. Where there is piety, there is universal obedience. A man may have great infirmities, yet be a godly man, so it was with Lot and David and Peter. But if he lives in a way of sin, he does not render his godliness only suspicious, but it is full evidence against him. Men who are godly have a respect to all God's commandments. Psalm 119 verse 1. There are a great many commands, and if there is one of them that a man has not a respect to, he will be put to shame another day. If a man lives in one evil way, he is not subject to God's authority, but he then lives in rebellion, and that will take off all his pleas and at once cut off all his pretenses and he will be condemned in the day of judgment, Luke 13:27. Depart from me, all ye that work iniquity. One way of sin is exception enough against a man's salvation. Even though the sin that he lives in is small, 
Such persons will not be guilty of perjury, stealing, drunkenness, or fornication. They look upon them to be heinous things, and they are afraid of them, but they do not much matter if they oppress a little in a bargain, if they commend a thing too much, which they are about to sell, if they break a promise, if they spend the Sabbath unprofitably, if they neglect secret prayer, if they talk rudely and reproach others, they think these things are but small things. If they can keep clear of great transgressions, they hope that God will not insist upon small things. But indeed, all the commands of God are established by divine authority. And a man who does not lay weight upon little commands keeps none as he ought to do. A small bullet may kill a man as well as a cannonball. A small leak may sink a ship. If a man lives in small sins, that shows he has no love to God, no sincere care to please and honor God. Little sins are of a damning nature as well as great. If they do not deserve as much punishment as greater, yet they do deserve damnation. There is contempt of God in small sins. Matthew 5 verse 19 He that shall break one of the least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of God. There is rebellion in little sins. Proverbs 19 verse 16 He that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul, but he that despises his ways shall die. If a man says this is a great command, and so lays weight on it, and another is a little commandment, and so does not regard it, but allows himself to break it, he is in a perishing condition. Number 2. Even though their temptations are great, some persons delight in iniquity. They take pleasure in rudeness and intemperate practices. But there are others who do not delight in sin. They can handsomely avoid it, and they do not choose it. Unless they are under some great necessity, they will not do it. They are afraid to sin. They think it is dangerous and have some care to avoid it. But sometimes they force themselves to sin. They are reduced to difficulties and cannot tell how well to avoid it. It is a dangerous thing not to do it. If Naaman does not bow himself in the house of Ramon, the king will be in a rage with him. Take away his office, and it may be take away his life, and so he complies. Second Kings 5 verse 18 In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Ramon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon. The Lord pardon thy servant in this. So Jeroboam forced himself to set up the calves at Dan and Bethel. He thought if the people went up to Jerusalem to worship, they would return to Rehoboam and kill him. Therefore he must think of some expedient to deliver himself in this strait, First Kings 12.28. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. He was driven by a plain necessity to take this wicked course. So the stony ground hearers were willing to retain the profession of the true religion, but the case was such that they thought they could not well do it. Matthew 13 verse 21 when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. They would have chosen to have lived and died in the profession of the truth, but they cannot brook confiscation, prisons, and death, and so they must be excused if they drop their profession. So Achan and Gehazi had singular opportunities to get an estate if they lived twenty years, they are not likely to have such an advantage, and they force themselves to borrow a point and break the law of God. They lay a necessity on a state, liberty, and life, but not upon obedience. If a man is willing to serve God in ordinary cases, but excuses himself when there are great difficulties, he is not godly. It is a small matter to serve God when men have no temptation. But Lot was holy in Sodom, and Noah was righteous in the old world. Temptations try men, but they do not force men to sin. 
and grace will establish the heart in the day of temptation. They are blessed to endure temptation, James 1 verse 12, but they are cursed to fall away in the day of temptation. Number three, even though they are afterwards sorry for it, some men may fall into great transgression, but when they consider it, they are sorry for it. They do not justify themselves, neither do they excuse themselves, and say others do so as well as they. And if men are left of God, who can help it? But they confess it and bewail it before God. It is an affliction to them that they were carried away with temptation. They see they have acted foolishly, that they have despised the commandments of God, and they hope they shall never do so again. Be drunk or lie again. Sometimes men take occasion to talk with them, and they are ready to own their fault. They are ashamed, and they shed tears, but after a while the temptation returns, and they are as bad as before. They are like the dead fish that are carried down the stream, but they are sorry again, and so they keep on sinning and repenting. Just thus it was with Saul. Jonathan talked to him, and he hearkened, First Samuel 19, verse 6. Saul hearkened to Jonathan, and Saul sware, As the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. After a while Saul was persecuting David again, but upon David saving his life, he wept and made confession, First Samuel 24, verse 16. Saul lifted up his voice and wept. But upon the invitation of the Ziphites, he pursued David again, and David spared his life a second time, and upon that Saul confessed and promised, First Samuel 26, verse 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm. I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. There is no trusting such men. If they live in ways of sin, they are ungodly. Godly sorrow will make men live holy lives. Second Corinthians 7 verse 10 Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. Application 2. Encouragement to those who have seen gracious actings in their own hearts. I suppose that there are several of you who have seen the actings of grace in their own hearts. You have seen the workings of faith, as Paul did in 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. I know him whom I have believed. Of love, as Peter in John 21 17. Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Of repentance is Job in Job 42, verse 6. I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. You may conclude from hence that you are godly. You may have scruples upon many accounts. You may be under difficulties because God hides his face at present from you. You may have temptation from singular afflictions or because God denies to answer some prayers and things that lie much upon your hearts. You may have difficulties from such workings of corruption as seems to be inconsistent with grace. You may have temptation because you do not seem to grow. But if you have certainly seen the working of a gracious spirit, if a hundred times, if ten times, or if one time, you may conclude that you are godly. That which was not in being could not be seen. That which is not is invisible. If there were no sun, moon, or stars, none could be seen. So if there were no faith or love, they could not be seen. There may be faith where it is not seen, but where it is seen, there it is. And you may conclude that you are godly for number one. This shows that there was, at the time, a principle of grace. The habits of grace are not immediately to be seen, but only by their working. If there is a gracious act... There must be a gracious principle. If there is not an antecedent one, there must be, at least, a concomitant one. For while a man remains in his natural condition, he cannot act graciously. Romans 8, verse 7. The natural mind is enmity to God and is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. If a man loves God, he is disposed to love him. If he believes in Christ, he is disposed to believe in Christ. It is impossible to do those actions without a disposition to them, and that disposition is a principle or habit of grace. Every man who acts graciously is a new creature. 
Until the heart is changed, it will not carry graciously. Any act of grace is a sure token of regeneration. If a man believes in Christ, he is certainly born of God. John 1, verses 12 to 13. To them that received him, gave he power to become the sons of God? Even to them that believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If a man breathes, sees, hears, and walks, he is certainly a living man. Where there is an act of life, there is a principle of life, 1 John 3, verse 7. He that doth righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Every effect must have a proper cause. If the heart were utterly opposed to believing, loving, or repenting, he would not believe, love, or repent. The heart of a man is always inclined to what he chooses. The mind may understand a thing that is not inclined to understand, but the will never chooses without an inclination so to do. If there is a change in the behavior of the heart, there is a change in the disposition of the heart. Number two. If a principle of grace was once there, it is always there. It was otherwise under the covenant of works. Adam's grace was perfect, but mutable, for he did not fulfill the condition of the covenant. If he had once done that, his grace would have been immutable. But under the new covenant, if a man is once godly, he always will be godly. For everyone who is godly has fulfilled the condition of the covenant. Grace may decay, but it never will be lost. It may wither, but never die. Common grace may be lost, but saving grace cannot be lost. If grace is once begun, it will continue. Philippians 1 verse 6 I am confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perfect it to the day of Christ. The power of God is engaged for the preservation of grace. So once godly, always godly. 1 Peter 1 verse 5 Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Sometimes they are afraid they shall fall away, but whether they have more strength or less strength, they shall never fall away. God's covenant is their security. Such men may have great temptations. Heretics may endeavor to seduce them. Vicious men may seek to debauch them. Worldly men may entice them, and persecutors may seek to frighten them out of their religion. But nothing can be too hard for them. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. Song of Solomon 8, verse 7 They may have temptation to pride, to presumption, or to discouragement, but if they are led into temptation, they will be delivered from evil. A principle of grace is like a living fountain. John 4, verse 14. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. False-hearted men may fall away, but those who are sincere will be more than conquerors. If Abraham is once godly, he will continue so, though he lives a hundred and seventy years. If grace is begun here, it will be perfected in heaven. Application number three. Of direction to godly men, how you may know your sincerity, which is by renewing the visible actings of grace. Many signs are given of holiness that will not bear examination, and there is danger that many are deceived by this. Some godly and some ungodly men who find them in themselves may be comforted by this, but they beget no assurance. And some men who find them in themselves remain at a loss whether they are godly or not. The way to know your godliness is to renew the visible exercises of grace. When a man sees that he loves God and believes in Jesus Christ, he will not be unsatisfied about his godliness. If he has been in the dark and in great temptations just before, yet this will beget assurance. Here you may observe, number one, if you do not know that you live in sin, that can be no evidence of your godliness, as you cannot condemn yourselves, so you cannot justify yourselves. Some persons examine themselves whether they live in any 
known sin, and upon the strictest inquiry, they do not find that they do. They do not find that they live in the neglect of any duty or in the commission of any sin. Their hearts do not reproach them. They duly attend prayer. They are careful to sanctify the Sabbath. They live soberly, chastely, and justly. They are true to their word and faithful in their places. They do not know upon the most narrow search that they live in any way of sin. Yet they cannot justify themselves from hence. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 4 I know nothing of myself, yet am I not hereby justified. For men who examine themselves may be ignorant that they live in a way of sin. Yet they may live in a way of sin. Men's understandings are corrupted, and they may live in pride, worldliness, and unbelief, and not know it. They may think those corruptions do not reign, when indeed they do reign. Many men who do not know that they live in sin are fain to suspend their judgment about themselves. They hope from hence that they are holy, but do not know it. Though men do not know that they live in sin, yet God may know that they do. Proverbs 30, verse 12. There is a generation that is pure in their own eyes, yet are not cleansed from their filthiness. Number two. If there is a great probability that you live in a way of faith, love, and repentance, that does not make it evident. There is some probability of some men's faith because gospel promises have been a comfort to them of their love because they are zealous and delight in ordinances and in praising God, of their repentance for their sins are a great burden to them, and they are careful to avoid sin. But probabilities prove nothing. That may be probable, that may be false. There may be some probability of a thing, yet the contrary may be certain. Probabilities leave men under uncertainties. If they raise hopes, yet they leave room for fears. There may be probabilities one way, and as great probabilities the other way. Men will not content themselves with a probable title to their land. God will not take men to heaven because there is a probability of their goodness. Number three. All the visible exercises of grace are evidential. The Word of God tells that all who believe in Jesus Christ are children of God, John 1, verse 12. To them that receive him gave he power to become the sons of God. It tells that all who love God are heirs of heaven, James 1, 12. God has promised a crown of life to them that love him. It tells us that all who have godly sorrow shall be saved, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Godly sorrows worketh repentance unto salvation. It tells us that all who love the brethren shall have eternal life. 1 John 3, verse 14. We know that we are translated from death to life because we love the brethren. Hence, if any of these workings are clearly seen, a man has a sure evidence of his good estate. He is ground to cast a case for himself. It is no presumption for him to conclude his justification. He has a divine warrant to give sentence for himself. At such a time when he pronounces himself a saint, he goes according to law and evidence. His confidence is assurance, for those exercises of grace that he is conscious of are peculiar to godly men, and assuredly distinguish them from all other men. Number four, the more these visible exercises of grace are renewed, the more certain you will be the more frequently these actings are renewed, the more abiding and confirmed your assurance will be. A man who has been assured of such visible exercises of grace may quickly afterwards be in doubt whether he was not mistaken. But when such actings are renewed again and again, he grows more settled and established about his good estate. If a man sees a thing once, that makes him sure, but if afterwards he fears he was deceived when he comes to see it again, he is more sure he is not mistaken. If a man reads such passages in a book, he is sure it is so. Some months afterwards, some may bear him down that he was mistaken, so as to make him question it himself. But when he looks and reads it again, he is abundantly confirmed. The more men's grace is multiplied, the more their peace is multiplied. Second Peter 1 verse 2 Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. The third time the question was put to Peter whether he loved Christ, he answered with greater assurance. 
The very proposing of the question stirred up the working of a spirit of love, and he spoke with very great confidence. John 21, verses 16 and 17. The first and second time he said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. But the third time he spoke with greatest assurance, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. It went greatly to his heart that his love should be so often questioned, and so he was more abundantly satisfied in the truth of his love. The way to know sincerity and hypocrisy cleared up. This has been a sermon by Solomon Stoddard. This is a Puritan and Reformed audiobook podcast. November 2nd, 2014.